We will commence our Bible study this evening with prayer. Let us pray together. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege we have afforded to us to gather around your word, to study your word, the word of truth, the word which is inspired by the living God, the Holy Spirit of God. We thank and praise you that in these changeable times, these volatile times, we can come as your people, and we can come to the unchanging word of God, and we can look and consider and meditate and learn of the ways of God. And we thank and praise you that you are a gracious God. You are a God of compassion. You are a God who is love, and yet you are a God who is awesome in your holiness and righteousness and judgment. For Lord, your word says in the book of the prophet Malachi, to you that fear my name. And may we each one be gathered together as those that fear your name. A holy fear. A fear which is uh, indicted by the power of the Holy Spirit within us. A fear of God and not a fear of man. Do cleanse us afresh now, we pray, and grant to us minds and hearts to worship you together. We thank you for your unfailing goodness toward us, and especially for your love in the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, who is our hope. We look to you now and pray that you will bless your word. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. But before we come to read the Word of God, we will sing together number 170, based on Psalm 103, verses 1 to 7. O oh, bless the Lord, my soul, let all within me join, and aid my tongue to bless his name, whose favours are divine. 170.
Please turn with me to the book of the prophet Malachi. We will read chapter 1 and chapter 4. The Burden of the Word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi I have loved you, says the Lord. Yet you say, In what way have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Yet Jacob I have loved. But Esau I have hated, and laid waste his mountains and his heritage, for the jackals of the wilderness. Even though Edom has said, We have been impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus says the Lord of hosts, They may build, but I will throw down. They shall be called the territory of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord will have indignation for ever. Your eyes shall see, and you shall say, The Lord is magnified beyond the border of Israel. A son honours his father, and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honour? And if I am a master, where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts? To you priests who despise my name, yet you say, In what way have we despised your name? You offer defiled food on my altar, but say, In what way have we defiled you? By saying, The table of the Lord is contemptible, and when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favourably, saith the Lord of hosts? But now entreat God's favour, that he may be gracious to us, or this has been done by your hands. Will he accept you favourably, says the Lord? Who is there even among you who would shut the doors, so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain? I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from your hands. For from the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place incense shall be offered to my name, and a pure offering, for my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it, in that you say, the table of the Lord is defiled, and its fruit, its food, is contemptible. You also say, Oh, what a weariness, and you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts, and you bring the stolen, the lame, and the sick. Thus you bring an offering. Shall I accept this from your hand, says the Lord? But cursed be the deceiver, who has in his flock a male, and takes a vow, but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. And please turn with me to chapter 4. The great day of God. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yea, all who do wickedly will be stubbled, and the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch, but to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like the stall-fed calves. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes unto the soles of your feet. From the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel, with the statutes and the judgments, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. And so reads the holy word of God for our instruction together uh, this evening. Now, <clears throat> come to the final study in our series on the Minor Prophets. 
and this evening we are considering the book of the prophet Malachi under the heading, When a Relationship with God Grows Cold. Now, the name Malachi means a messenger of the Lord, and it is evident from the way the book is written, Malachi is sending a clear message from the Lord to the people. Several times Malachi supports his message with, says the Lord of hosts. Now the Jews, as you know, were God's special nation in Old Testament times. He had chosen them, made a covenant promise with them. God had promised to bless Israel, and Israel had promised to be obedient unto God. But history has proven that while God was faithful to his covenant, the Jews often broke theirs, and therein lied the answer to their captivity. The book of Malachi is written at a time now after the captivity in Babylon. Many Jews had returned to Jerusalem. The temple and the walls had now been rebuilt. The city itself was back on its feet. It was functioning once again. Worship had been re-established in Jerusalem. But sadly, the relationship with the Lord had become lifeless and wearisome to the people. The people had settled down to life in Jerusalem. Although they were under the rule of another nation, matters were relatively peaceful. They were free to live in their culture. They were free to worship and develop their lives. It was into this situation Malachi was sent with a message from the Lord. He was given the great gift of seeing society as God sees it, seeing the people as God sees it, seeing the religious establishment as God sees it. Well, the religious establishment at the time, they had the truth, they had the right religion to practice for that time, in the Old Testament times. They had the system in place. But in a time of relative peace, they had become indifferent. There was no longer the anticipation when going to the Lord's house. Spiritual decline had set in and had infected society at large in Jerusalem. They were simply going through the motions. Now, spiritual decline does not happen overnight. It can gradually affect a church until eventually God stops speaking to the people and the local church becomes fossilised, as it were. And this is the worst position a church can find itself in. Not when God is warning, there is still hope when God is warning, but when God stops warning and simply leaves the church to its own devices. Here in Malachi, God was still clearly warning. An action needed to be taken. There was still time. And let us consider this evening then what action was needed to be taken to reverse the slide in Jerusalem and how the problems were revealed through God's servant. Well, firstly, the people were failing to appreciate the sovereign love of God. If we are truly born-again believers, we have been saved by the sovereign, unchangeable love of God. I have loved Jacob, and the Lord's spiritual church is sometimes known as Jacob, Israel. We have been chosen by God as vessels of his mercy and love, entirely and absolutely according to his gracious favour toward us. Now, when we genuinely appreciate the sovereign love of God as an amazing gift, then it will truly have the effect of captivating our hearts and our motives. Chapter 1, verse 2. I have loved you, says the Lord. Yet you say, in what way have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Yet Jacob I have loved. But Esau I have hated, and laid waste his mountains and his heritage. 
for the jackals of the wilderness. This was the area that Israel were failing to appreciate, that they were loved by God graciously, and they were sliding once again into taking their favoured status for granted as a right without a responsibility. Oh, we are God's people, we are God's chosen nation. And they were taking this in a presumptuous manner. There was no return of love to God and respect to God. And this was demonstrated in the way in which they worshipped. And so verse 6 we read of chapter 1, A son honours his father and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honour? And if I am a master, where is my reverence? Says the Lord of hosts. To you priests who despise my name, yet you say, In what way have we despised your name? You offer defiled food on my altar, but you say, In what way have we defiled you? By saying, The temple of the Lord is contemptible, and when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favourably, says uh, the Lord of hosts? So what action must be taken in this sad state of affairs? Verse 9. But now entreat God's favour that he may be gracious to us. While this is being done by your hands, will he accept you favourably, says the Lord of hosts? Well... They were wanting God's favour, but they were not prepared to show commitment to God's way, or to walk in a righteous way. They were careless. So what is to be done? If they want to know the gracious hand of God, uh, the, uh, the God's favour, uh, then they must uh, attend to proper worship. For God is saying, I have no pleasure in you nor will I accept an offering from your hands. Does this mean that if God is displeased with the children of Israel, that his work on earth is brought to a conclusion? No, because we have the wonderful gospel promise. If we read in verse 11, For from the rising of the sun even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place incense shall be offered to my name, and a pure offering, for my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. So we see how the children of Israel were careless, they were uh, profaning uh, the altar of the Lord, the worship of the Lord. And yet God's work must continue. God's name will be great among the nations. So God is warning the children of Israel, if you continue like this, uh, then the Lord uh, will leave them to their devices. So in the context of God's sovereign love, the challenge goes out to the Jews. In the face of such love, they lived as though true spirituality counted for nothing in God's sight. There was, as it were, painless worship. By that I mean their worship was not sacrificial. God had the leftovers. He was second, not first. There was thoughtless worship. It lacked respect for God who they worshipped. They despised worship. The priests and their duties were weary of the work. There was hypocritical worship. They were keeping up appearances. And so today, for the Christian believer, God says, <clears throat> I have loved you. Well, how can we be certain uh, God loves us? How can we be certain of this? Well, one of the ways we can be certain of this is to ask ourselves the question this evening, Do I love God? Do I love God? 
Well, the word of God says, if we love him, we only love him because he first loves us. So this is one of the ways uh, which we can know whether God loves us is by our response. We love him because he first loved us. And if we have those uh, elements of love unto God, it is a, an assurance uh, that we are loved by God in the very first place. But sadly our love can grow cold and faint. And we have to be so careful at these times. Well, the conclusions then from the first chapter. The people were failing to appreciate the sovereign love of God. They were presumptuous. They had lost their appreciation of the greatness and the majesty of God and true reverent worship. And the problem actually flowed from the example of the religious leaders. They themselves were greatly to blame because of their ungodly example. Robert Murray McShane once said, My people's greatest need is for my own holiness. And so our worship today should give a sense of the majesty and the greatness of the Almighty God. And may the Lord, with the enabling of the Holy Spirit, give us a reverent determination to serve God with all our heart, sincerely. But secondly, the leaders were failing to live according to their call. And this is found in chapter 2, verses 1 through uh, to 9. The problem was identified by the fact that the glory of God's name was not at the heart of their ministry. Their example simply confirmed the people that loose living was acceptable. And it's the same today. They failed to lead by example. And one of the greatest ways of giving false comfort to an ungodly person or a backsliding Christian is when leaders themselves are loose on holiness and they themselves promote ungodliness. They themselves promote worldliness. They themselves associate with, with films which are, uh, are, are of an unhealthy spiritual nature for example, and when a, 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 a backsliding believer sees this and witnesses this, it becomes a snare to them. And so it was here in their time in Jerusalem. How different it was with George Whitfield when he was uh, crossing uh, uh, the Atlantic to America. The crew at the beginning of that voyage were as an ungodly uh, crew, but the crew at the end of the voyage was a God-fearing crew. Well, the leaders at this time in Malachi had forgotten or rejected the historical example and lesson of their Levite forefathers long, long ago who had ministered under God's blessing. This had been replaced by a liberal attitude, a careless attitude. Let's get this worship over with uh, and let's have it our own way. Chapter 2, verse 5. The Lord is speaking about those blessed times with Levi, when the Levite priests were truly serving him. My verse 5. My covenant was with him one of life and peace, and I gave them to him that he might fear me, so he feared me, and was reverent before my name. And so we read that there was reverent worship. Their worship was biblical. Verse 6, the law of truth was in his mouth, and injustice was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity, and turned many away from iniquity. 
he was truthful and he was biblical. He walked according to the word of God and he was in fellowship with God. He walked with me in peace and uh, equity. And then uh, his ministry was effective. He turned many away from iniquity. If we want to be a true gospel preacher, if we want to be a true gospel witness, if we want to have a true gospel testimony, we have to walk as a believer should walk. And these men were truly respected. Verse 7. For the lips of a priest should keep knowledge and the people should seek the law from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But sadly, you have departed from the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. Well, the Lord said that these unfaithful priests of this day would finally be shown for what they were. Their messages will be ineffective. Their messages will be powerless. They will be carried away with their hypocrisy. But remember, at the beginning of these warnings, God is merciful. I want you to see, in particular, uh, having looked at these uh, 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 warnings and the uh, assessment of the Levite current uh, priests, uh, a minister at that time. If you look at chapter 2, verse 2, God's message to the priests, if you will not hear and if you will not take it to heart to give glory to my name. There's a blessed if here. This is God's mercy. Look, it's still not too late. If you will turn, if you will repent, if you will now seek to minister and to worship and to sacrifice for the glory of God and not for yourself. God waits to be gracious, but the time does run out on God's stopwatch of long-suffering. If the leaders fail to heed the warnings, to live according to their call, then finally they will become totally ineffective and removed. And if we travel the country, one of the saddest sights is to see church buildings that are now warehouses, and garages or restaurants. Their leaders haven't departed from the way and uh, suffered uh, the consequences. So verse 8, But you have departed from the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. There's a solemn responsibility then on the minister. But then thirdly, the people were failing to respect their relationships with one another. If we look at chapter 2, verses 10 through to uh, 16, uh, the treachery of infidelity. Not only was the relationship of God at Loeb, but also their relationship with one another. Despite the fact they had one Father and one God who had created them, they were willfully acting treacherously with one another at the same time as bringing an offering unto uh, the Lord. What Malachi is identifying here is that we can seriously damage a relationship with God and we can lose touch with God when our relationships with one another are bad. Wrong attitudes to one another will seriously damage our spiritual health. Cutting off brothers and sisters in the Lord, being judgmental of others, being in the habit of criticising grieves the Holy Spirit of God. Just holding the truth and praying for God's blessing will fail to have any effect, effect if at the same time we bring to God's house in our heart bitterness and when we refuse to repent of this bitterness. So we read in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, 
but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamour and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And so we have this uh, blessed and precious exhortation from uh, the Apostle Paul. And instead of being judgmental, in Galatians 6 verse 1, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such an one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. So there was not only, though, a difficulty in relationships between one another, there was particularly a, a failure to respect the God-given institution of marriage. This is also included in chapter 2. Here were people who were willfully marrying foreign wives. And they were willfully marrying uh, idolatrous wives from idolatrous families, from idolatrous nations. This serves as a warning about the sanctity of Christian marriage. It is not right when a born-again Christians willfully take an unbelieving partner and enter into a marriage covenant with that person. And one of the reasons God gives is because of the offspring of the marriage. Now, we know that children are not saved according to their family state. They are only saved by God's grace. Nevertheless, in his sovereign will, history demonstrates that on many occasions, God is pleased to bless the offspring of a true Christian marriage. There is something very beautiful in the sight of the Lord when two believers are united physically and spiritually and they come together in the fear of the Lord. So verse 15, but did he not, but did he not make them one, have a remnant of the spirit and why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. And this brings us up to the third point in chapter 2. The husbands were treating their wives in a very bad way. But here is an example, we might think, of a person that comes to Malachi. and He, he says, look, I am praying to God. I am even weeping. Uh, I come to the church, I give my offering, and yet God does not seem to be listening to me. Why is this, Malachi? And Malachi turns to the man and says, how is your marriage relationship? Imagine the man may be a little annoyed. What's that got to do with it? He asks the question, why does he feel like he does? And Malachi says in verse 14, you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously, yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. The problem is in your relationship with your wife. You are not caring for her properly. You are casting her aside, and yet she is your companion. And let us learn particularly from this passage the responsibility that husbands have to care for their wives. But then we move on to chapter 3 and we have uh, the refiner, uh, God, the refiner. Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is Come in, says the Lord of hosts, but who can endure the day he has come in? Who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and he is like launderer's soap. 
He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that you may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. God is not going to allow the situation to go on endlessly without giving the answer to the malady. His answer to sin is in the perfect righteousness of his only beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the opening verses of chapter 3, we have a prophetic statement regarding the coming first of John the Baptist and then following the coming of Christ Jesus the Lord. A way will be made in Christ Jesus the Lord whereby we can make an offering of righteousness that you may be able to offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Oh, the Lord does not change. His righteous law remains the same. But in Christ is there protection. Verse 6, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Despite all their past failures, once again, God invites us to come in sincerity before him, in repentance with body, soul and mind, to come with our gifts in sincerity and prove him. Verse 10 of chapter 3, Behold, bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me. Now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And in verse 12, And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Well, God invites us to come in sincerity then before him, in repentance, with body, soul and mind, to come with our gifts in sincerity and prove him. Do not rob God. Do not deny God. Do not disrespect God. Do not give God the leftovers, but the first fruit of our life. And God will grant his blessing. As we look at this with a spiritual application, we can offer unto the Lord a, a, a righteous offering in and through the work and person of our Lord and Saviour, uh, Jesus Christ. And we can experience spiritual blessing as we trust in him, because spiritual blessings flow to us through our Lord and Saviour, uh, Jesus Christ. Well, we have then... Continuing on in chapter 3, verses 13 through to 18, the issue of bad conversation and good conversation. The people had been saying, totally unjustly, it is a waste of time to serve the Lord. And instead of examining their hearts, they accused God of being unjust. What is the point of serving God when the wicked seem to be get on better than we do? It's a little bit like Asaph in Psalm 73. But they were missing the mark in their conversation. It was a conversation coming from the old nature, from the old man, in old man reasoning. But there was another type of conversation going on of a totally different nature that was among believers and its outcome was totally different. So we look to chapter 3 and uh, verse, verse um, 16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on that day that I make them my jewels and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. 
And then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. Well, the outcome of the spiritual profitable conversation is totally different. It's a blessed outcome. And there's a promise that comes with it. They shall be mine says the Lord of hosts on the day that I make my, them my jewels and I will spare them. Well, in chapter 4 uh, we have the final outcome. Therein we see God's wrath and God's love. And the last chapter of Malachi is dealing with the awesome separation and the effect of God's judgment and mercy. To those who were longing for Christ, his coming was very precious. Verse 2 of chapter 4, I mean it's a very solemn verse, chapter 4 verse 1. Behold the day has come in burning like an oven and all the proud, yea, all who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. Oh, for those uh, uh, who fear the name of Christ, for those who, who are longing for Christ, his coming was precious. He comes with healing in his wings. But then in verse 3 we have a solemn uh, condemnation to those who reject Christ. You shall trample the wicked for there shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on that day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. Well it was seen in measure uh, when the Jewish nation was judged in AD 70 for the rejection of the Messiah. But this is a picture symbolic of another day which would affect the whole world at the great day of judgment. For one group of people it will be a devastating and awful day. While for the other group of people who wait with anticipation for a second coming, oh the Lord will be as a son of righteousness coming with healing in his wings. But then at the end of the chapter 4, we have this wonderful uh, prophecy of the blessing of the gospel ministry. Chapter five, 4, verse 5, Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. And so uh, we know that there, this is, there is this wonderful turning in repentance under the preaching of uh, the gospel. And we know that John the Baptist was the New Testament Elijah and he was sent as the forerunner of the Lord and Saviour uh, Jesus Christ as mentioned in chapter 3 it's all connected here uh, with uh, uh, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and then in connection with the great day of judgment and in connection with the wonder of the preaching of uh, the gospel now as we come to conclusion in this study one matter which keeps coming up again and again in all our studies of the minor prophets is the necessity of having a real religion, a real faith. The danger of being lulled into a thinking that God is not concerned about us having a right relationship with him. Rather, let us respect God's love, respect our position, our relationships, our conversations, Turn to the living God, receive from him in Christ the fullness which he promises to all those that come to him in repentance. And uh, we can just look in conclusion then 
uh, at the uh, chapter 3 verse 8 uh, uh, <clears throat> wherein uh, uh, we read verse chapter 3 verse 6 sorry wherein we read for I am the Lord I do not change therefore you are not consumed O sons of Jacob because in the prophets we have uh, the minor prophets we have uh, very solemn passages of scripture speaking of the judgment and the wrath of the Lord but you see if we are fearing the name of the Lord if we are looking to that son of righteousness the Lord Jesus Christ who has heed in his wing in his wings and we are under the protection of his wings in pictorial way and we are trusted in him then we can take this promise of chapter 3 this statement of chapter 3 verse 6 and find assurance I am the Lord I do not change therefore you are not consumed O sons of Jacob it's good for us to remind ourselves then that many of the prophecies and promises in the Old Testament have two applications the national application to the Jewish nation for that time but the greater spiritual application to the church of God the worldwide true Israel of God. Now the Lord's people by nature are as the sons of Jacob. By nature our hearts are desperately wicked. The Apostle Paul wrote, O wretched man that I am, and this fact caused him to look to the Son of Righteousness, look to Christ and his grace. By nature we are not better than anyone else in the world. We are saved by God's grace and his grace alone. We cannot be saved by our own righteousness. It is God who has visited us with his salvation in Christ Jesus and granted us the gift of a new nature, born again spiritually and being sanctified by the same Holy Spirit of God where we begin to shine as lights in this world. As we truly repent of our sin and trust only in the merits, the righteousness and eternally finished work of Christ. We are not consumed by God's wrath because God's wrath has been atoned eternally on our behalf. Because of our faith in Jesus Christ, God's Son, who is the same yesterday, today and forever, we are no longer ruled or consumed by the change in deceits of Satan. Because of our faith in the eternally finished work of the cross at Calvary by our Saviour Jesus Christ, we are not consumed by sin or our guilt or the curse of the fall. Because of the precious blood of Jesus Christ shed for needy sinners, we are delivered by faith in him. The blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin but also because of the unchanging, eternal righteousness of Jesus Christ, imputed to us by God, we are justified before God eternally. We are not consumed under the uh, condemnation of God's law. Therefore, there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Because of the God-given faith of the Lord's people, in the unchanging promises of God, we're not consumed by fear in changeable times like we live. And because of our new nature given by the Holy Spirit in Christ Jesus for time and eternity, we're not consumed by the world. We are being sanctified and prepared for another home in eternity. Because of our trust in the eternal God as our refuge, we are not consumed by the ever-decreasing standards in the world. Because God is ever unchangeably faithful to his word and covenant of grace in Jesus Christ, we are not consumed by the error and the constant change in the professing church of our day. And because of the unchanging character and nature of God, his people are assured in him. Our lives through many changes go, but his love, no variation, knows. Remember I used to tell the story of Spurgeon when he visited his farmer friend and there was a weather vane upon which was inscribed the words God is love and it was a windy day and the weather vane was going this way and that way and Spurgeon said 
to the farmer, you shouldn't have put that text on that uh, um, that weather vane like that. It's not changeable like that. It's not uh, uh, going this way and that way. It's secure. And the farmer friend said to Spurgeon, Ah, what it's saying to you is that whatever way the wind is blowing, God's love is the same. I am the Lord. I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. So we have this precious word of promise. See it by faith, centred in the person and work of the Son of Righteousness. To you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. This is the security, friends. In this day, and in the day of judgment. And this is the one whom we must come to if we are in a backslidden state, in repentance. Come, prove the Lord. Come just as you are and prove the Lord. Will you not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing upon you? Oh, it's not too late to come just as you are. Listen to the message of the book of the prophet Malachi. There was still hope, but the long-suffering nature of God does have a stopwatch. And uh, the nation sadly entered into judgment again on AD 70 because of their rejection of the Son of Righteousness. Let us not reject him, but come to him. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we do pray that you would help us to learn from these minor prophets, to see, Lord, the relevance of our own day, and particularly to see the deeper spiritual application that can be made legitimately through the teaching of them. We do pray that you would give us wisdom, you would give us grace, and grant to us humility to assess our lives, to assess our commitment, to assess a demonstration of our love to God, we're in the way we walk. And if we have become lethargic, if we have become careless, help us, Lord, to be reconsecrated unto the Lord and to come just as we are and say, Here am I, Lord. Use me. And now may the grace of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and continue with each one of us now and forevermore. Amen.